Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, the, the lead pastor here. Man, we're really glad uh, you are worshiping with us. We're in the middle of a series um, in the last, talking about the last things that Jesus said, the things he said when he was, um, when he was on the cross. And two weeks ago, we kind of kicked this off and just kind of talked about how Jesus was authentically human, expressing physical need, expressing emotional need. Last week, we talked about um, how he was really others focused at this kind of this worst darkest, most painful moment of his life. He's worried about his mom. He is forgiving the people who have hurt him, and he's trying to save the people around him. And um, what we've been talking about, and we're doing it this week, we'll finish next week on Easter. <coughs> what we've been talking about is um, kind of how, you know, in, in these moments are kind of when your you know, who you really are is kind of exposed. Kind of at your worst moments, your most vulnerable moments, and we kind of get to these kind of depths of insight into, into Jesus' character. Well, one of the things that got me thinking about, it's kind of another one of those ways that kind of what's really going on in your heart and mind uh, really gets exposed is, is, is in your dreams, right? Now, sometimes you dream things that are just weird and you need to forget about, but sometimes, like I have these dreams where it's like, man, it was just like real, and so I'll just t- tell you a little bit, like at least once a week, probably more times than not twice a week. I will have a dream where I'm back in high school and I'm playing basketball again. And so obviously I still have a lot of unresolved issues about my basketball career. Um, you, you don't, you don't know, if you don't know me, I mean, there was a time, despite what you might see and how old I am now, I was actually a really, really good basketball player. And I was really tall. In fact, I was about this size in seventh grade. So if you have or know a 7th grader and you think you got a basketball team and all of a sudden this is coming up against them, I mean, it was kind of an intimidating thing. And I had skills. I was really good. And I had this, I had this big plan. I had this big plan that um, you know, I was just going to keep going and, and I was going to play for Nolan and it was just going to be amazing. And then suddenly I stopped growing. Right? And that matters, right, if you're trying to be a basketball. So I, obviously, I mean, in my heart, I would tell you, that I'm okay with that because I recognize, man, because, you know, the way that my life ended up going, I was able to meet this awesome woman who became my wife and have taken a completely different career path than what I was thinking that I would, and I feel great about it. But obviously somewhere in my heart still, I don't feel great about it because it just kind of keeps coming up, right? And then last night, uh, last night, so... (laughs) Last night, I had this dream where the owner, uh, operator of this uh, Chick-fil-A up here invited me to be um, a special guest at a Chick-fil-A banquet. I was like an honored guest at a... <laughs> and um, he, I don't think I need to interpret that. That is just kind of what it is. Um, but a few days ago, I had this dream. It woke me up in the middle of the night. I, um, I, 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 some of you... Ugh, backstory. I hate that I keep having to talk about this. We, we still own the house <laughs> that we lived in before we moved here. And you think, well, how long has he been here? Like a few months? No, like seven and a half years, right? And um, it's, it's, it's very stressful, and it just kind of comes and goes. I mean, anyways, so in this dream, something happened that I don't remember. But the part that I do remember is me getting really, really frustrated. And I ran into our bedroom. You know, sometimes it's not your bedroom, but it is your bedroom. This is actually our bedroom. Like, it was, it was our bedroom. It was our bed. And I jumped onto the bed, like like this, and I started screaming and sobbing uncontrollably and just kind of yelling in anger at God. Why is this still happening? Why do we still own this house? And I was so mad, and I was crying, and it was so intense, it woke me up at like 3 in the morning. And um, it took me a second to like, wait, did that, did I, did I just really do that? I was like, how do you still asleep? So obviously... I didn't. I mean, she would, I think she would notice if I threw a tantrum on the bed. And, and, and it was so intense, and it took me a while to go back to sleep. And then, and then I woke up the next morning, and I was still just kind of feeling it. And um, I was like, maybe, maybe I should do that in real life. Like, cause I, but, like, like, then I didn't, but I didn't feel like I needed to because it really felt so real to me. It's like I really had, like, in this dream, I got just a lot of... A lot of anger and frustration out there. And I, I think apparently, I think what this dream demonstrates is that I, I've probably been holding in a lot of anger, frustration, and disappointment in God um, throughout what's kind of the, this, um, 
series of unfortunate events that has, has kind of led, led to this happening over the last eight years. And, you know, I don't want to sit up here every week and say, hey, guess what? I'm still mad. You know, I don't want to talk to you. Know, that's not how I should do that. But I think even, even with myself, I don't know that I've been completely honest with myself about just kind of how, how frustrated I am and really just how disappointed I am with God for putting me in this situation. And it's interesting that all of this would happen in the week leading up to this moment where we're kind of talking about um, these particular sayings of Jesus. Because I, I think sometimes, and I think most of us have probably been there, where in one way or the other we've kind of been frustrated or disappointed or angry about something that's going on and, and, and we're blaming God. I mean, and you, and you, sometimes you point, is that, is that okay? Is that okay? Is it really okay or is, 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 is that bad? Is, does God disapprove of that? Does God want me to kind of pour, pour out in this way? But as we kind of, lean, again, kind of looking at what we're learning about Jesus from these, these moments on the cross, is one of the things we'll talk about today, kind of our big idea for today, is that Jesus, he had an authentic relationship with the Father. He had an authentic relationship with the Father. He, he talked to the Father about how he felt, about how we felt about him, whether it was good times or bad times, he was authentic in communicating with God about how he felt. Now, I want to kind of take a pause here because I think it's really important because um, we don't don't do this a whole lot. I don't want to get lost in the weeds of what it is that we mean as a church, that we're a church that believes in the Trinity. But let me just kind of just put this out here just real briefly, is that um, we believe that there is only one God, but this God is three persons which is where it gets confusing because we think about a person, we think about complete distinctiveness. But there is distinctiveness in persons, but yet there's only one God. And so it gets really confusing and we kind of get confused about really what that means. If that's a topic of interest to you, we have a lot of these kind of theological issues that we've done some videos on. You go to our YouTube channel, it's in the Cultivate, we talk about this. But we're going to talk a lot today because of this relationship that Jesus had with the Father. We're going to talk a lot about their distinctiveness, about how they can be different and have different ideas and and, 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 and one can be scared or disappointed or whatever with the other one. So we're going to talk a lot about their distinctiveness, but I want to make sure that we still understand that even in talking about their distinctiveness, that we believe in also their unity. Because honestly, (coughs) one of the things that I think is really cool is that they can be one God and they can be unified, but at the same time, um, we see Jesus kind of pouring out some frustration towards God. Which, if, 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 if that's the case, then I think it kind of gives us a little bit more freedom. And so this first passage we're going to look at is in Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew chapter 27, and if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about this, we kind of talked about it just kind of in, in, in the terms of his... Um, being emotional and kind of being authentically emotional and being authentically human. But we're coming back here today because I think we also just want to dive in about what this says about his relationship with the Father. So in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 and 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why... Have you forsaken me? And so what we have here is, is, is Jesus kind of pouring out this frustration. And if you were, again, if you were here a couple weeks ago, you heard this. This is connected to a psalm where David, who was anointed to be king, but wasn't king yet, he was being chased and hunted down by the guy Saul, who was the king. Um, God wanted David to be the next king. Saul didn't want that. He wanted one of his sons to become the next king. And so he's trying to kill David. And so he is running around and trying to kill David, and David's on the run, he's hiding. And he's having to hide in caves, he had to, at one point he had to go to live with his enemies, at one point he had to pretend that he was crazy. He's doing all these things, and in one of these moments, he's kind of pouring out this frustration to God. Why have you forsaken me? Because what you have in David is, like, man, I've done everything you've asked me to do. You wanted me to become the king? You wanted me to be anointed? I did that. You wanted me to go and serve with Saul? I did. You wanted me to kill Goliath? I did. I did all the things that you asked me to do. I've done everything right. I'm being exactly who you've called me to be. And now I'm sitting here in this stupid cave, scared to death. The king is trying to kill me. Where are you exactly in all of this? 
it felt to him like God had completely and totally abandoned him. I'm doing everything right. And yet, where are you? And so we have Jesus connecting with that. And so he's sitting there on the cross, and, and, and what he's saying is, where'd you go? And so what we see here in Jesus is this, is that he wrestled with God's plan. He wrestled with God's plan. And we see it even in the night before. And the night before, he's in a garden praying with his disciples. He's got one group of disciples over here. He kind of takes his, kind of his best friends and the disciples a little bit closer and says, hey, you stay right here and you pray and I'm going to go over here and, and I'm going to pray. They kept falling asleep and Jesus was getting frustrated with them. But in the midst of that, in the midst of that, it says that Jesus is so emotional that he's sweating, but he's sweating like he's bleeding. And some people thought that maybe he was like sweating blood, but I, I, think, I think the image is like sweating so much it looks like you're bleeding. So like if you, if you cut yourself open, I mean, blood's just pouring out. Most people don't sweat like that. He's just like, you know, oh, it's, it's kind of comfortable. Or, this and, or even if you sweat a lot, it's kind of like, oh, you're, it's coming. But just imagine you're sweating so much it's pouring out. So he is so anxious, he is so, he is so sad, he's so scared. And in that moment, he looks at God and he's like, God, if there's anything else we can do, let's do it. And then, and then the next night here on the cross, God, you, you've forsaken me. But here's the thing. He, he knew this was going to happen. He was actually part of the plan. He, he decided in advance that this was going to be the plan. He came down here knowing this was going to happen. He knew the future. He volunteered for it. It was in part his idea. And even still in that moment, he's expressing frustration and anxiety and wrestling with the plan. I don't want to do this. He says that on the front end. And, on the, and, and during it, he looks at God and says, Where did you even go? Connecting his heart with King David during this darkest moment where he feels like he's doing everything right, but God has abandoned him. So he was part of the plan and he, and he still struggled. He, he wanted to do it. He volunteered for it. And he still wrestled with it. And he still expressed it to God. And, in, and, the, and there's, there's a realness to that, that. That I think is important for us. Because my guess is, is that at different times, and maybe some of us right now, there have been parts of God's plan that let's just say, I'm, 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 I'm wrestling with. And Jesus feels complete and total freedom to express that. Now this is one of those moments, and I've been kind of battling this a little bit the, um, with this entire series, because there's kind of two things that we're trying to accomplish here through this series. The first is, is that we kind of want to get a little depth of insight into who Jesus is. We say that we follow Jesus, we want to follow Jesus, we want to learn about Him, and our faith deepens the more that we understand who Jesus actually is. And so we're getting this kind of new depth of insight into into what Jesus is like by hearing His last words. But there's something else that we want to do too. It's like, hey, I follow Jesus, so if Jesus is like this, I want to be like this. The problem is, is there's really, just to be honest, that with rare, rare exceptions... We're not wrestling with, with things on par with being executed and tortured in a horrible way. And so just like Jesus on the cross is you, and you just feel bad, right? And it's like there's nothing, there's really, there's really not anything. But at the same time, I think there are some, some core reasons why Jesus that is he's struggling that I think that we need to identify with. While the act that he's going through is horrible and, and is really completely different than any of the things that we're wrestling with. The issue. Because the issue was th- this plan that God had where he's having to sacrifice himself. He's having to give his life away for someone else. Suddenly his life is not his own anymore. He is having to go through this horrible thing and it's not, it's not what he wants. Who wants that? Who wants to suffer through that? But he knows it is the right thing to do. And I think the thing that we all wrestle with in some way, in one way or another, is this basic idea of whether or not your life is your own. Is your life, does it belong to you? 
Do you get to decide what you want to do and what you are and what your life is going to be just simply based on what you want and what you think is best? Does your life belong to you? Or does your life belong to the one who created you? And I think there are a lot of us, man, I think that's just kind of at a basic core level. I think most or all of us wrestle with that in some way. Is is my life mine? And if my life is not mine, but it's God's, then He can put me in any situation that He chooses to. He can ask me to do anything that He chooses to, and it's fine, and I have to go along with it. I am, mm, I am voluntarily choosing to participate in His meeting. I am voluntarily choosing to believe and say nice things about Him and follow His advice... But I'm, 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 but I'm, I'm still in, I'm still in control. I'm still in charge. And honestly, I think it's that idea why there are so many of us that I think I would say are hovering on the outside of Christianity. We, we like the idea. We're fond of Jesus. We know that God deserves something, and we like this church. And, and, and I think it's important, religious, spirituality, that's good. But I would, but we're hanging out on the outside because honestly, to get fully on the inside, to say that I am a legitimately a follower of Jesus Christ is to recognize that my life fully belongs to God. And the things that I've done, the sin that I have, that I have done, that is a violation of God and it has to be reckoned with. I didn't just make some mistakes like, hey, sorry. No, I, I have violated a God that, that owns me, that, that, that is in control of me, that my life and everything I have belongs to Him, and my violation, that's got to be dealt with. And in receiving Jesus, I am saying, hey, I recognize that my life is yours, that I have failed you completely, and I want to give my life fully to you, and now, give, and, and now live in such a way where my, I recognize that my life is yours. Well, I just, I just, I just want a little spiritual life. I just want to kind of connect. I want good life advice. I don't, I don't want to surrender something because my, my life is mine. And I'm guessing there are a lot of us that are wrestling with that. Big picture. And it's keeping us on the edge. My encouragement today is that we jump in fully. And that even as you're wrestling with it, man, pour it out to God. Tell Him why you're wrestling with it. Tell Him the frustration that you have, the concern that you have, the fear that you have, the anxiety that you have about giving, giving up control and losing control and direction of your life and giving it fully to someone else. Express that. Because all throughout the Scriptures we see this, including in the, in the life of Jesus. So I, I got a frustration is like, I, but, I don't, but I don't want to. I don't like the way that sounds. Put it out there. But even if you have, even if you like big picture, like big picture, I get, I get it. Big picture, I get it. My life belongs to God. And, and, I, and I agree with that. And I've done that in giving my life to Jesus. I still think in the day to day, all of us still struggle with that basic idea. Do I get to decide today who I'm going to be and what I'm going to do based on I choose or does God get to tell me? So we just started. Some of us are struggling, kind of, with some relatively basic ideas. Does your money belong to you, or is it God's? And He gets to decide um, how much of it He wants back, and how much of it He's going to allow you to have. Does He get to decide that? Are you going to give back to Him what He says He wants from you, or not? Or is you giving God anything? Is that you being generous to God? God asking for something back that's His is not you being generous. It's just you being obedient. But we wrestle with that even conceptually. What if He also says, man, I want your life to be about serving other people. Uh, well, you know, I kind of got, got some things. I got some high I, I, I'm busy. No. This is what I've told you. You're mine, and this is where I want you. I want you here. I want you to serve. Is my life mine? Do I get to say no to that? 
but I don't want to. Well, it's not really relevant. You should pour that out, but that's the wrestling that we have. And I see this too with people. And kind of as they're trying to struggle, make decisions. See this a lot, we're kind of dealing with people in marriage. So people are dealing with marriage and, 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 they're, having, and they're having these battles and it gets to this, this, this point of, of where it's, it's almost over and the, let's just say in this instance, the guy wants to leave and, 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 you talk, and, and, and he's like, dude, you, you can't leave your family. And then he says this, and this, this brings out my punching reflex. Doesn't God want me to be happy? No. <laughs> well, okay, I think about yes, but happiness, as as you define it, is, is stupid. And 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 if I know you well, that's what I'll say to you. And I'll just say it to you right now, if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking like that. Um, but re- contentment, peace, life, whatever you want to call it, is actually found in obedience. And you fledged in front of God and everybody that you were going to stay faithful to this person. And your abandoning now is not going to make you happy. It's going to make you disobedient. And you need to do the right thing. But I don't want to. I'm not happy. I don't care. And it's fine to wrestle. Again, it's fine to wrestle. But you need to know what you're wrestling with. You're wrestling with the idea that I don't particularly care for God's plan. And so I think it's good. I think it's good and healthy for you to put this out there. And, and for me, I don't want to own that house anymore. It feels like a huge burden. It is a huge financial burden. It is a huge emotional burden. And I'm sick of it. And I know that you could do something about it. And I don't want to be over here anymore. I want to be over here. I'm not leaving. I'm still here. I'm staying with my family. I'm staying with my job. I'm doing all the things that you want me to do. And you could relieve me of this burden. But you're choosing not to. And I don't like it. I want to be here. And he says... I I want you to live under this burden. But but I don't. And I'm not sure what this says about you that you do want me to do this. You know, go back to a a, a sillier example. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a basketball athlete. And I thought it was it, it was a season in my life. It was realistic. It was realistic. And then, it was, and, then it was, and then it was gone. I'm telling you, I made so many deals with God. I cannot tell you. Oh, if you'll just let me grow five more inches, you just let me get this height, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And I'm telling you, I'm doing all those things. I'll become a missionary, I'll become a pastor, I'll do whatever. And I'm doing the whatever. And God says, that, sounds, that, sounds, that all sounds like a great idea. I'm still going to keep you short though. And in hindsight, it makes perfect sense. In hindsight, it makes perfect sense. You think that you want this, but I want this. And, and, and so this, this is what we're going to do. And, and, and eventually, it's going to make sense. So it feels like a burden, what you're going through. But ultimately, it's not. And, and this is kind of what we see. We see, we, see, we see both pieces of this with Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, verse 44. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, Into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, which is like a Roman guard, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Quick side note, we talked about this last week, how when Jesus got up, he was up there and he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what to do, and that he could have prayed that silently, that asking God to forgive the people who were killing him. But he said it out loud, I think in part, to show us 
his forgiving spirit, but also I think he did it for those present. That those who were complicit in his murder would hear him forgive them in case they came to faith. And here's, here's an example of a guy who seems like maybe he's coming to faith. And my guess is, is that there were several moments in his life after that where the, where the forgiving words of Jesus that he got to hear brought him a lot of comfort. It was just kind of a cool little thing. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking specifically at this last thing that Jesus said. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So he expresses this anguish and this out. He said, God, I don't know where you are. Why did you leave? Where did you even go? But then what he says right before he dies is, my spirit is yours. I'm trusting you. And so while he did wrestle with God's plan, he fully trusted him. He wrestled with God's plan, but he fully trusted him. He, with, with, with full trust, even though he had felt incredibly anxious the night before, even though he had, was, was wrestling and feeling uh, abandoned by, by the Father in, in that darkest moment there on the cross, he fully trusts him. It feels like you've abandoned me. But I know that you've got this. I know that you've got this. He knew that ultimately God is good. And even though he was wrestling with this plan, even though he felt this level of abandonment, he knew, he knew God is good. And ultimately this is going to be good. Hear good different than happy. Hear good different than fun. But hear good. For Jesus is good. For our good. God is good. And He is working good. And He is doing good in your life. And whatever it is you are wrestling with, I encourage you, one, put it out there. Don't act like you're not. Put it fully out there. God, I'm wrestling with it. Don't hide it. Don't pretend that you're not because you are. But whatever it is, let it end in trust. How can I give? I don't know what's going to happen. How, who's going to take care of me? God said He's going to take care of me. He's good. But I, but, I don't, but, I don't, but I don't want to give my life fully to Him. I won't have control anymore. But you're not doing that great anyway. And God is good. You're something. But you're not good like God. But this decision that I know that I'm supposed to make. I don't know that I can. But when you do, you're following the one that is good. It does not make one sense, one bit of sense at all to me why God would want us to walk around with a burden that we don't need to have. Why God would... would, I mean, it's one thing to intentionally limit someone financially... So that they can give. It's another thing. This thing that we're doing. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm frustrated with it. I'm done with it. I was, I was, I've been done with this for a long time. But God is good. And He is doing good in me. And there's something that He is trying to do in me and for me that I need. And I have to trust that. Doesn't mean I don't tell him. I tell him. I tell him. I tell him so much. I guess it spills over into my dreams. Keep telling him. But ultimately, I have to trust in his plan. And there is something that is holding you back. There's something that is holding you back from saying that I fully give my life to Jesus, fully and unconditionally. There's some lack of trust. There's some issue that you're dealing with. Some lack of control. And you're, and you're battling. And it is time to move from wrestle to trust. I trust in a good God who will take care of me. I will trust in a good God whose plan is better than my plan. And I will fully trust Him and fully surrender. And even if you've already done that in the big picture, 
Jesus makes it very clear that this idea of surrender is a daily process. Years before he died on the cross, he said this. He says that you need to take up your cross daily. Which didn't make sense to them the way that it sort of makes sense to us now, seeing Jesus die on a cross. All they knew was taking up your cross daily would mean I'm going to willingly let myself be executed every day. And what he means by that is I have to make a decision each and every day of complete and total surrender to say that my life is not my own. And what God says he wants from me, that's what I do. What he wants me to do, I do. Who he says I am, I am. And what my life is supposed to be, he gets to decide that. And sometimes that's in little moments, like choosing to be generous, by choosing to volunteer. Sometimes it's in bigger moments to stay in a commitment that you want to bail on. Sometimes it's learning to deal with something that you would never choose. But God is placing in your life for a reason. But today I decide. Today I decide. I'm going to to trust. I'm going to trust that today you've got a plan. I'm going to trust that you are still good. And I'm going to trust that you have the best interest for my life. And then tomorrow... I do it again. And then the next day, I do it again. Every day needs to be a day where we move from wrestling to trust. Be open, be honest about the the holdbacks, the hangups, the fears, the anxieties, the, the, the frustrations that you have. Put it out there, but move to trust. So don't hold it in, but don't stay there either. And move to a place where you can say, long before your last breath, into your hands I commit my spirit. So my guess is, if we kind of move to response, that there's going to be some, some kind of some honest praying that some of us need to be doing. We kind of put maybe some things out there verbally to God that we've been holding in there. And then we need to be praying for each other that we can move to trust. So there'll be people in the back that can pray with you if you need. Um, You can pray there at the cross. You can pray at our prayer candles. There's an opportunity to take communion. Um, We're also going to have our offering. And which is kind of one of the things that one of the things that is is a weekly reminder for all of us that my life and what I have and my stuff, it's not mine, it's his. And that my life is meant to be a generous, sacrificial life. So I encourage you to respond through giving, through prayer, through worship. And let's pray for each other. That we can be honest with God and move to trust. Let's pray. God, I just thank you just simply for just kind of what you're doing in my life. How you're helping me move to trust. That God, no matter how frustrated I've gotten, God, that you've always been there. And I know that you're working for my good. And God, I pray that that would just sink in a little bit deeper. Each and every day. And God, I just pray for for all of us. God, whether in rebellion about a moral decision. We're scared and anxious about a situation we find ourselves in. Or God, we are the people who are still just hanging out on the fringe. Not sure if we can really follow you at all. Pray to God that you would help each and every one of us move to trust. And we love you, God. We thank you for your son, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.